Okay, on this video, I just want to have a little deep dive into England. Uh, so come all, but especially come on in, grab a seat, uh, fellow <laughs> disappointed and also weirdly slightly proud and a bit confused England fans because, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm having all those emotions and many more. Uh, hit subscribe if you haven't already on the channel. Thank you very much for watching. I'm Tim, this is Egg Chasers, and uh, I've absolutely loved uh, bringing you content through the Six Nations. If you appreciate it, hit subscribe. There's much more coming. And more importantly, I want to hear your comments uh, about what you made of that from an England perspective. Let's just shine a light on England for a second. Again, just to preface it with many congratulations, Ireland. Amazing rugby team. Um, but I can just put my England hat firmly on now as a, as a fan and say that that was much improved. It was exactly the reaction you wanted to see after France last week, which... I'm, I'm relieved, looks like an anomaly. It looks like just a really bad day at the office. I thought England were decent against Wales. I thought they were decent today, or at least there were lots of things they did relatively well. And I, I think if you just try and erase the France game from your mind, that is the outlier here, isn't it? That France performance. And there was, there was a lot of spirit. There was a lot of tenacity. There was a lot of... Uh, there was just good attitude on show. All those things, it's, it's, I think it was Warren Gatlin that, that coined the phrase, be the best at the things that take no skill. An effort, an attitude, they were lacking last week, uh, but we saw that today. And that should be, and with, I'm sure with the England players, it is an absolute minimum expectation, but um, it, was, it was good to see nonetheless. Still, and let's look at where things need to improve, still we've only laid foundations uh, because the the defense looked better the the scrum line out mall is good um but the attacking game's got to develop and that's where england have got to focus between now and the world cup i mean fair play ireland only conceded what six tries in the whole tournament which is incredible in five games um and england bagged themselves um did cross the whitewash today, but not as threatening as we need to be to go and beat one of these great teams. The only thing I will say is, and it's worth remembering this, is, and thank goodness too, the World Cup pools have landed very, very favourably for England. So we may not have to play really well or can get away with not being at our best until we get to, well, I say quarterfinals, but we, I mean, you'd rather face Wales or Australia than Ireland... New Zealand, South Africa, France in the quarterfinals. And so, so it's conceivable that England may not have to face a real elite team until the semi-final, which means there's bags of time to get things right. And I think, if you take again, if you take France out of the equation, Steve Borthwick is just layering on the elements of his game that he wants to build. Um, I'll go through the team shirt by shirt, and I'd be really interested to, to hear what you think, who who you think stood up well, what, what we've learned, what you take away from this game and, and looking forward for England. Um, so yeah, their attack absolutely has to develop. That's a, that's a non-negotiable. That's the next stage. But straight from the first minute, there was a bit of bite, wasn't there? And I mentioned this on my previous video, but there's been a lot of talk in the, uh, during this Six Nations about how England are trying to implement a new defensive system. And I was trying to work out what that system was. And when I've watched them in the last couple of games, I've been, particularly against France, I was thinking, I didn't know whether it was an attitude that was making England more passive or whether England were trying to play a slightly more passive defence to offer the team a bit more yards. If you play rugby, you'll know what I mean by saying a hard and a soft defence. When you play a slightly softer defence, you give a little bit more space, but you keep the you keep the shape intact and don't let them breach your line. And I think that might be what Kevin Sinfield was going for. But today, England were flying off the line and just hitting people, hitting everything that moved. And there was a bit of bite and there was a bit of niggle. And I think that suits England. I think English players know what they're doing with that. And it that seemed to translate even when we had the ball. The collisions were much better for England. 
and that meant that the breakdown you we were able to compete that little bit more and Jack Willis had a, had, a, had a great day at the breakdown there, slowing Ireland down. And I think that's why you saw some of the Irish players like Jameson Gibson Park suddenly not quite looking as good as he normally is. That's why the tactical game was a bit more in the balance and Ireland didn't have it all their own way. And I thought England's tactical kicking was better. It's why Jack Van Portfleet looked a little bit better because there was a slightly more solid base. So I think all of that, a lot of it stems from defence and that was good. Um, let, let's just, let me just have, have a quick moan. As we're on this English on on this English focus one, let's have a moan, a little bit more of a moan about that red card decision. This cannot happen, and I'm not even saying this just as an England fan, and I'm not saying it would change the result. This cannot happen. If a team goes out of a World Cup in a tight game because of a decision like the one we saw today, it will be an absolute travesty. And I don't even know if it's Jacko Piper misinterpreting it. Maybe that red card will get rescinded in a couple of days' time. I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't. If it gets upheld by World Rugby and that is deemed a red card offence, then I don't know what to tell players. What does a coach tell a player? Like, it's it, it, it's mind-boggling. And the whole point of these law changes around the head contact was to try and protect player safety. Rugby's a dangerous game. Sometimes accidents happen. And a little bit of empathy for the fact that these players are out there playing a game at 100 miles an hour and accidents can happen. And when accidents do happen, then it's not always needs to be sanctioned with a card. Sometimes accidents just happen. And I felt for Freddie Stewart today, but I'm not saying this as an England fan. I'm saying it as a as a fan of rugby in general, knowing there's a World Cup around the corner. This is our, the biggest shot window we've got. And you could have people watching, scratching their head and seeing a game completely ruined and a team's chances lost because of a decision like that. Have I judged that decision correctly? Am I out of line there at all? Do you agree with it? Do you disagree with it? Let me know in the comments. Anyway, and while I'm on a moan, um, ITV, I, I mean, I, I love Nick Mullins as a commentator and as a human being. I'm lucky enough to work with him and uh, he's an incredible man. So uh, love his commentary and I would always pick it. Um, there were so many things ITV weren't good at today. I know they moved it over to ITV4, but missing the trophy being lifted to go to Ant and Deck just felt like a bit of a kick in the teeth. And then did they play the Owen Farrell interview over the top of the trophy being lifted, which um, I wasn't sure about. And equally, there was the pundits were talking as the players were coming out of the tunnel. This is like a big occasion and a big moment. And I think some of the gravitas of the occasion was lost a little bit today i have my issues with bbc i'm not saying they're perfect by any means absolutely not uh they're not but um this is anyway moan out the way i'm not being negative let me go through the england team and i'll take you through step by step so um yeah that's why I'm, i did i say that already i just made a note 2007 because england don't have to play brilliantly until the quarterfinal, semi-final of a World Cup, and we could still get to a semi-final whilst not being a great team. Think of 2007. England was a shambles. Got absolutely pumped by South Africa in that first game. Got to the final and could well have won the Rugby World Cup. So don't give up hope. I've got. I've still got hope. Lots needs to change, but I've still got hope. Uh, right, Ellis Genge. Um, scrums look good today. I think he may. He gave a few penalties away in some areas. Um, and I haven't seen Genge rampaging with the ball enough. That's one thing we're missing. But some of those fundamentals he's doing, okay, fine. Jamie George, decent enough. Arrows were okay. Scored the try at the back of the driving mall. Um, he's good. He's not Dan Sheehan, though, is he? You know what I mean? When you see Dan Sheehan, or even when you see um, Montoya for Argentina or Marchand for France or Malcolm Marks for South Africa... Whether it's they're massively strong, whether it's they're incredible at the breakdown, or in the case of Dan Sheehan today, whether he's just like another back row when he's when he's a ball carrier. We're just lacking a little something there. I like Jamie George, but that's why we need Luke Cowan Dickey back in the fold. Carl Sinclair, um, one of the best games I've seen him play for a while, won a few scrum penalties. He seemed really zen. Did you notice at one point Carl Sinclair actually said to Lewis Ludlam, calm down? Kyle Sinclair was calming down Lewis Ludlam. Like, what? What's going on? So, Carl Sinclair's head was on today and he, and he played better as a result. Dave Ribbons. Oh, sorry, let Marutoji first. Uh, did some decent things. Still not 
Maru Itoji that's just it completely imposing himself on a game. And because of what I'm going to say next about Dave Ribbons, maybe I should be encouraged that Maru Itoji, I think he will end up being an automatic selection because we know the class he's got, but he shouldn't be an automatic selection because I thought Dave Ribbons was really good. And he looked a little bit like George Cruz. He reminded me a bit of George Cruz today, really throwing himself around, proper tight headlock type of stuff. So I like that. And with him and Ollie Chesham, you know, th there's options there. Um, in the back row, Lewis Ludlam threw himself about a bit. That was good. Defensively, tough. Jack Willis, absolute beast. Love him. And after being so outplayed last week, it was really good to see Jack Willis throwing himself about. And uh, I, I like him a lot. Alex Dombrant played for about an hour. Did some things okay. He should have been there for that first Dan Sheehan try. That was his That was his hole that, that Dan Sheehan ran through, um, I think. I'd have to check the tape on that. Don't want to be unfair to Alex Dombran, but that was my gut feeling at the time. And I think when you reflect on the tournament as a whole, it hasn't been a great one for Alex Dombran. And I'm, I'm one of his biggest fans. I, I absolutely love him. And I don't know if he, he has to be behind a really dominant pack to show the best. I don't know whether he has to play with guys like Marcus Smith and Danny Kerr who bring out the best in him or whether it's that the premiership is a bit easier to impact the way Alex Dombrandt does, which he hasn't managed to translate to international rugby. So there's a question mark there. Uh, Jack Van Portfleet, I like what an absolute nuisance he is. He's like, he's one of those people that, and I, and I like this in the scrum half, opposition fans will just like take a real dislike to. I think that's how scrum half should be. So I quite liked him today. And his box kicking is very good and it was better. The tactical game was, was decent. So that was good to see Jack Van Portfleet because last week I was thinking he's not an international nine. I've still got a big question mark. I still love Alex Mitchell. I still think Harry Randall, Rafi Quirk. There's, there's options there and it's a bit concerning that going into a World Cup, we're not sure. But he looked like he had something today. Uh, Owen Farrell. Right. I get accused of being biased towards Owen Farrell. Uh, on this channel. I do have a bias towards Owen Farrell, but I think that bias is absolutely justified by the fact he is an incredible rugby player, an amazing human being, a brilliant leader, an England rugby warrior and legend. And I think he... I think there's a lot of people today that will have watched that England performance and fallen in love with Owen Farrell again. He got his goal-kicking sorted out, which have to do, being a fly-half in, in his team, and to, to what justify his place. But that said, and this is not a slight on Marcus Smith, who is fantastic as well, Owen Farrell is our best fly-half. George Ford may come back and be in form and, 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 and knock that, but... And I'm not saying Marcus Smith was... like He was playing against a France team and an England team that were poor last week. And England were better this week. And maybe Marcus Smith would have looked great this week. But Owen Farrell is a test match animal. What's that? 107 caps now? 106 caps? Grand Slam winner. European champion three times. Premiership champion five times. World Player of the Year nominee. European Player of the Year winner. He is an incredible player. And I think we saw what Owen Farrell's about today. And what Owen Farrell in the England team brings to it it's a bit of steel from that first minute he gave away a penalty because Jameson Gibson's park didn't quite hit the floor before he smashed him but he put up the up and under and he absolutely smashed an Irishman and set the tone and it was a penalty but I remember th I, I, I thought at the moment like he's on it he's on it today and the way that other coaches the way that other players talk about Owen Farrell the way I opposition players the way Johnny Sexton talks about Owen Farrell like that does transmit itself to a team and I, I, I'm not saying Marcus Smith was the cause for the poor performance last week but I'm saying that I bet I think Owen Farrell had a disproportionately big impact on an England improvement this week and he is England's best 10 and he should be wearing 10 for England as far as I'm concerned not end of discussion I think there are always options and players playing in, playing with form and stuff but I think at Farrell answered a lot of critics today. Call me biased, if you will. That's absolutely fine. Henry Arundel didn't get a lot of chance to do much with the ball. A few touches. But he's only 20. It's early days. 
he's just an exciting guy. Um, and the fact Matt Hansen was quiet, I think that's a positive. Uh, Manu Tuolangi played 80 minutes and played well. And I thought it was a bit harking back to the old days, but there is something to be said for tried and tested partnerships. We saw it today. Bundyaki and Robbie Henshaw know each other from Connacht, from Inc, from Ireland, and that bared fruit. A lot of those Irish combinations are, are really play a lot of club level, have played a lot at international level. And 10, 12, 13 for England played in the Rugby World Cup in 2019. Owen Farrell, Manu Tuolangi, Henry Slade. And I think you it, it brought a better performance out of all of them as a result. Just linking that to Henry Slade, who's still, much like Alex Dombrandt, I have a little question mark next to, and I quite liked Joe Marchant when he came on as well. He's um, he's tough. For a guy his size, he is a hard man. Uh, Anthony Watson, like, just like him. I, I, I want him on the wing. Uh, Freddie Stewart, talked about the red card. Joke, in my opinion, but maybe that's where we are and maybe I'm out of touch. Maybe that's where the game is, but... Um, Disappointed that, that that decision happened. Don't think it affected the result, but there we go. Mako Vinopola, didn't really, I don't remember him being on for very long. Uh, Jack Walker, Ditto, Dan Cole, the Cola Bear, 100 caps, well done for that. Um, Nick Ezekwe, um, okay, did he get on? I'm not sure. Got big question marks over the, the bench front five. That's where we need do need an overhaul, whether it's Bevan Rod, whether it's Val Rapava Ruskin, Luke Cowan Dickey needs to get back. Hopefully, George McGuigan's back fit, Jack Singleton. Tight head prop, Oof. Trevor Davison. I wouldn't look overlook him. He's a hard man. Um, just lacking something at tight head on the bench as well. Dan Cole, not to take away the 100 caps. That's a massive achievement. Ben Curry, I'm pleased he's had more caps because it would have been a shame if that first game against Scotland was uh, was all he got. He's not he's not quite Tom Curry, but he's he's a tough little nuggety player. He does put himself about. Alex Mitchell uh, didn't, didn't, I mean, didn't actually up the pace as much as he normally does. He was playing against Ireland, who and he was there. England had a man down, and then thirteen men as well. Um, Marcus Smith, I don't think he was used, was he? And Joe Marchant was decent. Um, overall, summary is: if you could just erase that France game from your mind, I'm satisfied with where England are I'm not pleased I'm satisfied and I'm not thinking that England made a mistake in hiring Steve Borthwick because I think he the fundamentals have been sorted and I'm pleased about that and we just attack we've got to develop the attacking game and I don't, that's, got, that's got to be coaches hasn't it and I know Richard Wigglesworth is coming in but he's relatively new to coaching I know him and Steve Borthwick know each other well um, maybe Alad Waters coming in will help the conditioning of the players in the build-up to the World Cup but how much difference will that make I don't know people talk very highly of him but it just feels like they need a slightly older head it's a very young inexperienced coaching team and you just feel like they need a wise head um, to navigate a Rugby World Cup which is going to be a massive pressure cauldron but if I had to give it a grade um C plus, satisfied, work to do. Um, the France one last week was a, an ungraded, get out of the classroom or you're fired, or whatever. I'm, I'm mixing my analogies there, but you get the point. But taking that out of the equation, a lot of pride put, put back in that rugby shirt today. A dreadful rugby shirt, by the way. I, I wonder if that's part of the reason why England are playing so badly. The shirt is awful. We need to change that before the World Cup. Please, sort it out, Umbro. Um... <laughs> I will see you on the next video. Hit subscribe, leave your comments, like, share and all of that.